My special thanks to uh, Goral and uh, Gotham for br always bringing me to the land of my parents. It's always a privilege to come here and to see the kind of progress that goes on in this country. And now for something totally different. I'm going to talk about uh, improving RUI pregnancy rates. In fact, the title could well have been Why Men Are Important in Art. And I just don't mean art like going shopping, how efficiently men can go shopping from one place to another. But I really want to say that if you take care about what the male factor, you will turn around your pregnancy rates and I will, at the end, I hope I'll show you that you, you may well be able to match IVF pregnancy rates here. I'm going to skip through some things very quickly because here's the definition that we, is currently being used about uh, what infertility is. It's failure to conceive after regular unprotected sexual intercourse for one year uh, in the absence of known uh, reproductive pathology. And in the UK, if you look at the uh, contributory factors for um, uh, infertility, we, I'm just going to focus on this male factor causing 30%, uh, and then there's this unexplained infertility, about 25%. And it really brings me to this uh, point that if we combine the male factor, the uh, purple one there, and the unexplained, we're really reaching 55% here. That's half your game is about the men. And um, although they're unexplained, we know, I, in fact, I know what unexplained is. It's that over the years there's been an evolution as to why we do not want to understand what unexplained infertility is. It takes me back to all Rumsfeld's talk about the known knowns and the unknown unknown. Well, just to focus on the second last line, it is the unknown unknown. In the old days, people used to do postcoital tests. They used to extensively look at anti-sperm antibody tests and all and semen mucus compatibility tests. But with the evolution of time and the advent of IVF, all this has gone aside. And in fact, you you could really try and identify some of the factors. In the UK, the, with the advent of IVF, the multiple births ra rate just shot up uh, astonishingly, a and um, uh, which, uh, which is one of the reasons why IVF, uh, uh, sorry, intrauterine insemination has been done for a very, very long time. And these are, I don't need to explain to you the, the, the indications for intrauterine insemination, but these are, this is really the first line of your, um, of your treatment. Um, and just the question of what is mild male factor infertility, and it's astonishingly that it's used so often, the term. Uh, and, but, it, uh, but there's no formally recognized definition uh, as far as uh, when, when you search literature. And we have what we call the NICE guidelines, and they use the, uh, the, the, the definition as to when two or more semen analyses have one or more variables below the fifth centile as defined by the WHO 2010 criteria. Okay, the position about IUI in the UK, it is the best clinical uh, practice would use the low risk and minimally invasive procedure. But there is a latent problem of uh, creating vast numbers of embryos um, which you need to freeze and on balance will never be used and that's in the IVF uh, uh, setting. And then you have the cost of freezing and discarding the vast number of embryos uh, and unlike IVF there's no waiting list and it is cost effective. But, you know, one of the latest things that's happened in the UK, and I'm fighting this uh, with the government, uh, in fact, I've been consulting colleagues, because e everyone seems to be afraid to deal with it, is that the NICE guidelines came out and said, do not do IUI under any circumstance. Uh, and, and I find that quite astonishing, uh, because when I looked at the detail of what was, uh, on what evidence, because NICE is meant to gather evidence, and there was absolutely no evidence that they could engage uh, in this data. And I looked at it very carefully, and in my pocket there are tons and tons of questions that I'm trying to raise with the government here. Uh, 
Uh, and uh, what has been published so far is that there is a certain cost effectiveness in IUI and globally, outside the United Kingdom, the most number of treatments that are practiced around the world is intrauterine insemination. It does not require the complex setting of uh, IVF uh, 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 laboratories and all that. Uh, so, and so what is the problem? When I look at the problem is that the old IUI data, first of all, there's very little, astonishingly little published, relatively little published, but it all relies on old stimulation re regimes. Uh, and if you look at the clomiphene citrate versus gonadotrophin, you find that the uh, gonadotrophin is far more superior in terms of um, the, uh, uh, the, the effectiveness. Now, when I looked at our HFEA, the Human Fertilization and Embryology Authority data, now I used to be a member of this authority, that 21 members set by parliament who, who really set the standards here. And if you submit the wrong information, you could lo lose your license. Uh, and I, when I looked at the 2011 figures, uh, in fact, the pregnancy rate for that was 13.7% per cycle. And in 2012, at the bottom, it's not too different. It's about 12. So we, we're looking at, at 12 to 13 percent per cycle. In my own clinic, what we, when I, because I work in different clinics, uh, I s took over from in 2000 at this specific clinic at North Middlesex uh, University Hospital in North London. Uh, uh, where they were getting a mere four percent per cycle, and I said, "This is crazy. You can't. We cannot work like this." Uh, and so, w the first thing that you do to improve your pregnancy rate is you set up a database, where taking every possible variable into account, uh, and begin analyzing what you're doing. So, having set up a database, you you can see that the first thing I said get rid of the Clomid cycle. So in 29, we, we, we then, on 2010, we went into uh, HMG. But uh, the consultant I was working on, she was freaking out. She said, oh, no multiple births. And I said, oh, take it easy. Uh, so she, she, she only wanted 75. So we, 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 we hummed and hard for the next two years. And I said, come on, we're going to go for 150. Second line, 150. HMG, and that's, uh, you know, in fact, the, the latest data that I have is 19% per cycle. Uh, and the, this is beating UK aver uh, average of 13% per cycle. Now, that is not a bad figure. Now, I'll tell you why it's not a bad figure. Because when I looked on uh, all the uh, fancy IVF clinics, they say, oh, we do, we've got 12% per cycle. But hey, well, you know. Uh, we're getting 19% per cycle. Now, th this data is still valid today from this clinic because it appears on their website. The, uh, this is the chairman of our HFEA, but what is uh, interesting is what she's saying. Is that I'm a bit concerned that there's one IVF clinic getting 59.8% uh, pregnancy rate and, uh, uh, and the other clinic uh, in IVF setting is getting only 23.5 percent. So what is going on here? And she does. Uh, I, I think her head is n nicely screwed on because she is saying, "Well, okay, success is success, but if there's a failure, how are we managing these failures? And why is there such a huge discrepancy uh, in, in results?" So going back to our o own data, year in year out. I worked out what is a pregnancy rate per woman, and astonishingly, uh, they're, they're, we're, we're breaching 25%. And of course, the 2014 data that we have recent, the most recent, is actually touching 30% per woman. So, so now let's go back here. Uh, if we if we go back, uh, look. There's a, IVF clin a major IVF cl uh, clinic in the UK getting 23.5%. That's IVF results. Look, w this is an IUI program where we're hitting 30% now, you know? So this is quite astonishing uh, the data. Sorry, I'm going backward. And although we offer a six-cycle uh, treatment, 
I would needed to know, are we justified in doing the sick cycle? And the short answer is yes. Uh, although we didn't, uh, for odd, some very odd reason, we never achieved any pregnancy in the second cycle. Then I what I did was I broke up the data into the age bands because that is the age bands that we need to submit our data uh, uh, for, to the HFE. And there, uh, per, win uh, per cycle, we're looking in the first red column and in the second column per woman. And there, these are quite respectable results that we're looking at. I also wanted to know what is it about the men's side that we needed to do uh, and um, uh, so I broke up the data in under 5 million and over 5 million living sperm, not the sperm count that was done before they did anything. We are talking about living sperm for that insemination. Uh, and the lowest that we have inseminated was 1 million, but the uh, lowest that we have achieved a pregnancy is 3.5 million living sperm. I know that in another clinic we have achieved pregnancies with one million living sperm in that IUI cycle. Now I'm talking about progressive living sperm, all right? Now I thought, oh, let's just break, the, break up the data a little bit more and see if there's an optimal area and we go over five to 10 and over 10 million. Oh, it seems as if there might be a drop in uh, the pregnancy rate if we put more sperm, but is this really true? So we split this data in a little bit more, um, am I going in the right direction? I'm going back, aren't I? <coughs> okay, so we broke the data in a little bit, and it's a bit reassuring because we only, uh, having put m greater than 20 million sperm, during that insemination, it was not a detrimental effect. Uh, so at least we feel reassured. But, but what we're learning so far, it's a numbers game. Numbers of living progressive sperm here. And that is what's been published elsewhere too, is that the more living progressive sperm you put, the greater will be your pregnancy rate. And it's published elsewhere too, you can see uh, this, that if you put greater than 5 million living sperm, you'll have a greater level of pregnancy. In another publication, they were looking at, uh, again, this is another publication which supports the idea that you need a minimum of 5 million living sperm uh, for, that, for your insemination. And that's re 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 basically reiterating the same. Now, there's something else that I've been doing, and we, we, this is innovative work, and I'm going to tell you. Don't tell anyone, I'll tell you. Um, and that is, uh, if you look at the abstinence times of men, uh, you know, these are the kind of sperm parameters you have. But have you ever wondered what happens uh, when you guy, ask a guy, so you produce a sample, as far as I'm concerned, I just want more living sperm. Go and do another sample. And he said, uh, but I can't. But I said, look, I'm trying to help you. And that's the area nobody has really looked at. It's a very short abstinence time. And you won't believe it. I actually, just before I came, I saw one sperm sample, less than a million. Uh, I was in a rush to catch, I, I had to catch the flight to last Friday to come to, uh, to India. And I said, go do another one. It was 56 million. Where did those sperms come from? On the first one, I would be saying, ICSI. Next one, I said, okay, you're good in a far UI. So there's something, what we're doing is manufacturing. We're looking at uh, a couple situations. And I work as my work closely with a nurse, and we, we, we develop a lot of ideas together. The next, uh, the other thing is that there's a good correlation with sperm motility. The greater, the, the faster they're moving, they, they they'll, will have more pregnancy. It's not rocket science to understand that, you know? Come on, uh, so, uh, and, and what is so astonishing about the second ejaculate produced so soon after the first is that progressive motility is so much better and we, we presented this at Ashray. Okay, so I have termed it consecutive uh, ejaculate analysis. 
and in fact 58% of all our insemination were consecutive ejaculates. And in fact, 62% of our pregnancy for this year, I'm only referring to this year's, because so we have a much bigger database now, which confirms the same thing, uh, where that, in fact, 62% of our pregnancies were associated when I asked the guy to produce a second sample immediately after this, the, the first. Men are important, you know? So that is making the difference now. If we look at the continuum of sperm uh, fertility, well, you can see sperm count, you can see motility, you can see morphology. But you're not able to see the chromosomal content visually, and you're not going to be able to see the DNA integrity, uh, and also other molecular factors that are linked to fertility or infertility conditions. And there are also yet more molecular factors. So these are things you see and things you don't see, all right? So, but all these ma points are very, very important to succeed. So there are hidden abnormalities within those each sperm cells, uh, and, and basically that the paternal contribution is not only one half of the embryo's genome, there are exclusive messenger RNAs, proteins, and structures that need to be delivered into the oocyte, and these are all important until the embryo genomic uh, activation has to occur. And these are the um, uh, hidden uh, sperm abnormalities you can look at the molecular markers and the uh, non-nucleic acid-linked uh, uh, markers here. Then there's the DNA fragmentation. We hear so much about DNA fragmentation, although the, the results are controversial. What, what they really do is that if you had to translate that into the quality of the embryo, you find that there's greater asymmetry uh, with a higher degree of uh, DNA fragmentation. Now, in your laboratories, you know how you're preparing sperm, for instance, for intrauterine insemination for IVF ICSI. Uh, what is so astonishing is that the clinicians in charge never ask, what is your recovery rate? And the recovery rate is, you, you know, I work in three different clinics, uh, in one clinic, it was assumed that you lose 90% of the living sperm. That's not what I want. I want to change the culture. I want to grab all the living sperm and get rid of the, uh, the dead sperm here. Uh, and so in another clinic where we had those very high success rates, the focus is in making sure we recover most of those living sperm. So the difference between the cl uh, one of the clinics is that we focus on getting uh, the, uh, practically all the living sperms, and it, it could be at the expense of dead sperm too, but it is making a difference in our pregnancy rates, all right? But in the other clinic, well, you've lost 80 to 90 percent. That is the assumption upon which they're working, and uh, because they can afford that, well, we'll just shift them to IVF ICSI they'll just have to pay more. So that's a different culture here. And of course, as development takes place, there are more and more things that are coming into play for especially ICSI, MC, PICSI, and whatever, you know. So uh, the patients are gonna have to pay. It's all fancy stuff. You do not need to do all fancy stuff if you pay attention to the core values. This is a picture given to me by Garrido in Spain, and he's, what he's doing is looking at magnetic uh, activating sperm cell, uh, uh, activated cell sorting methods here, where they, it's a very, very simple, astonishingly simple method where they just tag on your so-called whatever uh, uh, target you want and push out, you know, catch out all the uh, a potentially apoptotic uh, sperm cells and you're now left with clean sperms. Uh, and, uh, and then they use it for insemination and look at the difference that they're finding. In the control, he had 13%. These are IUI pregnancy rates, all right? 13% uh, per cycle in the max separated sperm. We're looking at 27% per cycle. I know that from our own figures, we can go much higher because I know what the, the fault lines are so far. So basically, we need to be looking at the molecular factors. Um, uh, uh, I mean, sperm, uh, there, there are too many factors there which are beyond our vision, and they all need to be taken uh, 
care of. The other area that I'm going to focus on, we hear so much of, is the ROS, uh, reactive ox oxygen species and male infertility, where they cause damage at different levels that we know. You know, look uh, on, on to the far right, it says prolonged stasis of sperm in the epididymis or in transit. What am I doing with that double ejaculate? There isn't the time for it to sit around in the epididymis now. It, it, we're flushing out. It, it, it works in a lot of patients. It doesn't always work, but it's worth a try. And, and then in order to, to, to nullify that, you have to, you can use uh, extreme, extreme, extrinsic uh, uh, antioxidants and um, you, you could actually modify your sperm washing medium. Now we haven't done any of that here. Uh, and the nutritional considerations um, of what, what, what is good and what, what scavenges free radicals to the right here. Uh, so, um, but, but when you look at the Cochrane review of what the antioxidants for male subfertility in 20, up to 2011 is, just the last two points is that the evidence for improvement in sperm parameter is not substantial, which is, which is okay because I do not expect to see a change in the sperm parameter. It is really at the micro, micro level, molecular level, uh, that if you look at the pool findings, there's an increase in the live birth and pregnancy <coughs> rates with antioxidant use uh, or by male partners. So that means there's something going on at a molecular level that is important. What other areas do, do we think we could improve our pregnancy rates on? And what caught my eye is that if you use clomiphene citrate, maybe the, uh, the leading follicle size is significantly larger than the gonadotrophin cycle. And I said to our, our nurse, I said, maybe we need to switch that over a little bit because maybe for years and years, everyone has got it wrong on CC, you know? Uh, maybe we need to really look up, uh, in a bit more detail as to what, it, what you, so we actually may need to take a step back and go into clomiphene citrate and see what is the optimal, um, optimal uh, 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 sizes size. for the follicle. Of course, BMI is important. What, uh, uh, what else, uh, the, what you, uh, this is yet another publication where, where, where they highlight BMI, uh, sperm, uh, the motile sperm count you're inseminating with. Uh, and this is just another way, uh, or another publication which says that perhaps if you incubate that sperm f for 24 hours and if there's a 56% cutoff value in the sperm motility, it's predictive of high UI success. I'd find it very, very difficult to do that in, in real terms in a laboratory, but that's what's been published. Uh, the other areas is that uh, what has been published, obviously, is the um, pregnancy losses, which seem to have a strong contribution with increasing female age. Again, it's not uh, nothing new, uh, and that male uh, age had no effect on the rate of, of pregnancy loss. Now, I published uh, nearly 20 years ago on about 5,000 donor insemination cycles. Uh, where we use young donor sperm. Uh, 20 years ago I said, if you use young donor sperm, you can reduce the level of miscarriage in older women. Uh, that was only a one line. I didn't have enough data to support that, but I can believe that that is uh, uh, probably the case today um, because the, you know, we don't think in terms of miscarriages as being due to the man here. And so uh, we, we, uh, I'll come back to this point uh, in a second because I have some data to show you. Uh, of course, with ovarian reserve testing, you could start manufacturing what level of stimulation you want to give your woman uh, with a view to optimizing that cycle of IUI. Um, I'm gonna skip that. Now, if we just go back and uh, argue that in postmenopausal pregnancies, if we're, we're to use do donate young donated eggs, that will maintain that pregnancy. But if we also use young donor sperm, as I had published many years ago, is that actually there is 
uh, an effect of father's age by, uh, uh, in terms uh, on the chromosome uh, and the level of uh, sperm damage that occurs uh, with age. Now, I've done my work. I'm going to give you uh, a test now so that you can get your certificates from Goral. There are two methods here, method one and method two. Um, <coughs> and I'm going to tell you that per woman, in method one, 27% of the uh, pregnancies uh, the, the f were became, women became pregnant. And in method two, 25% got pregnant. Uh, per cycle, uh, in there were 21.1 percent against 13.7 percent, um, in and per embryo it was 15.3 percent. But there were no embryos in the second method here, so I've just dropped the figure down. Um, I think on the face of it, I suspect that you may want to go for method one, um, although you may begin to question whether if you were to work out the data per woman, whether there's any difference between method one and method two. Would you agree? You wouldn't agree. Okay. Let, let's t test you out a little bit more. I'm going to sell you method one at 4,000 pound per cycle. I'm going to sell you method two at 1,000 pound per cycle. Instantly, you, the patient, which one would you go for? Given that I've told you that 25% of the women on <laughs> that side will get pregnant and 27% will get pregnant on this side. You, the patient, which method would you be going for? Method two, thank you. Okay, actually, I haven't made up any of this data. It is the HFEA database of 2011, which nobody has actually looked at. <laughs> and that is the fundamental basis upon which NICE have made the decision. And in my pocket lies very nasty questions for the government as to what they have done. Um, and I'm working on it. They have just, they had yesterday sent me an email which is so astonishing, so mind boggling, uh, that I think people will get a shock in London. I've been talking to some of my colleagues here. Uh, in one case, they fob off a whole clinic to, uh, when they were told. They said, well, the odds ratio of multiple births in IUI, stimulated IUI, is tenfold. <laughs> tenfold what? <laughs> so they've got it all wrong. But anyway, that, uh, dear colleagues, is my talk. Um, but before I finish off, there's a Professor David Spiegelhalter in Cambridge University who went through every house in the United Kingdom in 2013 and he found that there are 900 million heterosexual encounters leading to only 770,000 babies. Not a very terribly <laughs> efficient way of making babies. <laughs> but thank you. Uh, you've not mentioned anything about the morphology of sperm. Is it not important at all in this kind of uh, setting? or? Um, because we see plenty of patients with, uh, with the recent WHO criteria um, with uh, morphology less than 2%, less than 1%. Um, so what do you think about that? Morphology is a very tricky issue purely because with the WHO criteria changing, we're down to 4% normal forms. Yes. And it's, uh, you know, the error in counting 4% is huge unless you count 800 sperms. And we do that for diagnostic purpose. We don't do it for uh, for uh, cl uh, clinical. No, but suppose you got a, a, a sperm count of, shall we say, 25 million and 30% grade A motility with 1% uh, normal form. Would you still advise them to have? Because uh, by the guidelines, it's all fine. You know, I mean, yeah. what would you do? The logic we're using, if they're moving forward, they'll move forward, you know? Uh, uh, it, uh, it's how uh, yeah, know, but then, but the, then, but the then published data shows progressive motility is a factor yeah. and the number of living sperm is a factor that can influence your pregnancy rate. Morphology, you, you the, the problem with morphology is you've got so many changes in criteria that over the years even whatever people say about morphology as a factor for preg achieving pregnancy uh, it's very, uh, the, the, the weight isn't, I don't have the confidence to put my, uh, uh, 
I, well, I don't feel confident about the data because it, even today in it the United objective. Kingdom yeah. where people, 95% of IVF clinics are not accredited to do semen analysis according to the WHO uh, 2010 criteria. I see. Uh, you haven't mentioned anything about your miscarriage rates at all in your, in your data. No, uh, we, I haven't because uh, it's something I need to look at. Um, and I think we will, because the HFEA have not specifically asked us to collect it, and neither do they. No, because uh, an IUI cycle would have uh, its associated uh, fair share of miscarriages. So, you know, uh, that would be relevant, I think. I would think, I mean, although HFEA does not. I mean, we, we know that there are miscarriages, and I think at some points I, I'm concerned about it. Yes. But then as time goes on, it seems to be okay again, you know. But uh, the final destination is a live birth, isn't it? It's not just a yeah, pregnancy, yeah, so yeah. I think... Um, but you see, one of the things, uh, again, what NICE had was they did not have live birth data to go by. So the pregnancy rate was taken as a proxy to live birth, which is interesting in a way, but that's incorrect. Yeah. But there's nothing more you can do.